Welcome to the Hustle and Flow podcast. The platform we use to explore varying perspectives and opinion through candid conversation. We chat about philosophy, business, and all things life. I'm Sean the Hustle. And I'm Les the Flow. Let's go. All right, guys. Today we're joined with a special guest. Her name is Georgia Ellis. Georgia is the founder of Blue Chip Minds, a peak performance platform helping organizations and their people to unlock hidden potential, achieve personal mastery, increase productivity, and tune into the flow and thrive now and well into the future. She is passionate about building self-awareness in individuals and organizations and has coached, mentored, and taught in over 15 countries across the globe. She is also the creator and host of the Ellis in Wonderland podcast, an exploration of both inner and outer worlds and sharing of insights from her years of experience, as well as from individuals who, like her, are living lives of purpose and sharing their unique gifts with the world. So with that, I'd like to welcome in George Ellis. Thanks for being on the show with us today. Hey, what a pleasure to be here with you too. I'm um, a bit excited about where we're going to go and um, what uh, proverbial rabbit holes we're going to be jumping down together, hey? Who knows? No, nah, we're excited too. <laughs> we're excited too. And um, Liz has just told us a little bit about you, but um, what we'd really love to hear, Georgia, is your origin story and how you've come to be the Georgia of today from Georgia herself. Okay, how I've come to be the Georgia of today. Well, every day I'm a different person. I, don't, I think just my origin, when does my origin start, the day I'm born or before that? It's, really, it's a really powerful question. So how I came to be the Georgia of today has got so many different facets to it. There's personal life, there's business life, social life, there's every facets of life in there. But I think one of the, the ter- I'll, I'll say turning points probably for me was not knowing that I was living a life by other people's rules. So living a life based on society, religious upbringing, um, family rules and dynamics, cultural rules and dynamics. Um, and I had no idea that this was, this was who, I, who I was. And just before I reached 30, my world sort of came tumbling down around me. Well, my life as I knew it. So uh, I was in a, in a relationship with my, at the time, husband. And he, I found out he no longer wanted to be with me. Turns out he was having an affair, all these yada, yada, yada things, like we'd struggled to have kids. I had all these things happening leading up to that. So just before I turned 30, he came home and he said to me, I don't think, I think we need to separate, I think were his words. And that was you know, nearly 20 years ago now. And I, it was almost like I had the, um, the rug pulled out from underneath me and I just did not know where to go because my life was all around being this perfect wife. You know, we ran a business together. I'd left my career to run this business that was his idea. And so I just, you know, struggled for a while to try and save that. But I was also living by society's rules and the rules that I thought we had to live. And, you know, when you marry someone, you're with them for life, apparently. Um, (laughs) You're nodding. Um, So that then led me on a little bit of a deep exploration of who I was and starting to unlearn the rules and beliefs and bullshit I'd bought into and started to slowly unfold my wings and create opportunities for myself and tap into this deep reservoir of potential I didn't even know existed within me and started to deliberately create my life from there. So that would probably be I'd say the turning point in the origin story of me being who I am today and then over the past 20 years going on a journey and delving into so many different modalities, um, sciences, anything you name it, I, you know, I scratched the surface and sometimes went deeper. So that's, I think, in a nutshell, that'll probably do it for now, right? Yeah, cool. No, and um, it's really interesting, I think, find people that lead more interesting lives, I guess, that we, we find interesting as, as humans generally have this turning point in their life, I've found. Mm. And something happens, there's like a catalyst, a, a catalytic event, something which does pull the rug from under them and um, has them question things. Yeah. But I wonder if that can change. I wonder if, I wonder if we really need to have that, an event, 
you know, can we look at people like like us, like people out there that have had these events and go, wow, what have they taken from that? Can I, can I capture some of that for myself so it doesn't need a massive turning point and I can start to take on and follow in their footsteps, standing on the shoulders of those who walk before me without the trauma? Who knows? Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because that's something Liz and I talk about a lot, actually. Um, and it's it's been the subject of a lot of our conversations is do people need an event like that? Or is there a way that they can, as you said, stand on the shoulders of others and learn from their experiences and, and then move forward in a way so they don't have to have that traumatic event or or that real massive life-shifting moment um, that can pull the rug from one of them? So have you found that people can do that? I'm still still experimenting with that. Yes and no. I think there's a beautiful gift in, I'm going to say trauma, but it's not always trauma. I think there's a beautiful gift in it. And... If we look at, you know, what we believe science is telling us about creation, how creation started with a big bang, like that was a traumatic event in the universe, if we really want to look at it that way, which created these amazing effects afterwards. So maybe it's just the way the universe is designed that we just follow in that we have a point of creation, which we see as trauma, but it's actually a melting pot of creation for us. And I think it's something that Sean and I have talked about quite a bit, as as Sean mentioned, and we talked about it in different veins. Like, you know, we talk about this, like, uh, I guess the cyclic view of life and death and, you know, the cycles of nature and things like that. And I think that sort of plays into it. And, you know, I myself, that particular question is something that I have questioned for a long time as well. You know, having myself and, you know, listeners of this podcast will know um, I had my own catalytic event, which was uh, cancer diagnosis, uh, which, you know, shifted my world, you know, turned that upside down. And then I reflect, you know, on the journey that I've had since then. Um, Do other people need to, you know, be diagnosed with cancer to, to wake up essentially, you know, and realize that, you know, that they, they are living a life that is dictated by others rather than themselves, like, you know, living from the outside rather than living from within. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, um, one of the things that Zen Buddhism says about, you know, trauma and suffering and things like that, it's just a perspective on, on how we perceive it. And this is more of a modern Western view, I think, that, you know, it's, it's seen as a bad thing and we really like um, comfort and we've really been drawn towards that. So we've built a world that, you know, really leans towards, you know, all this comfort and, and ease and um, <clears throat> all that sort of thing. Uh, whereas Zen Buddhism, that, that like boiling pot analogy is like life is like you sitting inside a, a pot of boiling hot oil. And then to find Zen is to realize that you're home, you know, within that boiling pot and that's it. It's just a realization that with life encompasses a level of suffering and trauma. It's just how you manage that, deal with it. And then, you know, like you said, that there is a growth and uh, emergence from each trauma, whether it's small or large or whatever. So uh, it's an interesting question. I think that, um, in terms of whether people can, you know, um, you know, actually take things from other people's trauma, I think it's possibly that the the role of people uh, who have um, experienced the 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 larger traumas to to be role models and you know share their experiences with the world in the hope that they can pick up, like you said, a little trinket of 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 wisdom there to to push them towards the right direction, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. And I I don't really believe that there's one size fits all or one answer for everyone. We're all so complex and unique that my journey and what I've done may not help somebody else, may not be what they need. So, um, which is beautiful, which is beautiful because that means we all have a purpose then. We all have an ability to to help those around us because there'll be certain people that will be be able to connect with my story and who I am and where I've come because of what I've been through. And Leslie, there'll be people that will be able to connect with you because of what you've been through. Okay. And that's, I, I, I guess I'm saying guess part of our, cause no one really knows 
part of our role here to you know to help each other through our own experiences it's it's like joseph campbell's hero's journey so you have the, the cycle of the journey where you go off and you slay your dragons but then you come back and tell your story that's a really short version of it yeah. um, <laughs> So you come back and tell of, your story yeah. in, in the hope to be able to help people, you know, on their journey. Mm. Yeah, and, and I completely agree with you. And it's something that, um, you know, I like to say a lot on, on this podcast and Sean uh, echoes this sentiment as well, I believe, because you've actually said it, um, is that help is a request and not an offer. And I think that just speaks to that, that notion that um, if you feel a resonance to someone's particular message within your heart, then that's what draws you in. But it's not that um, as someone with a story, you can naively think that it, it is of help to every single person on earth. So, Yeah, and that's a lesson that I had to learn. Yeah, absolutely. Like early on going through what I went through, I went, oh, God, the whole world needs to know this information. The whole world needs to know how to get through, how to un undo all of these beliefs that they have that don't serve them and to let go and surrender. Everyone needs to know this. When potentially they do, but not everyone's ready for it. And so it was a real journey for myself early on knowing when to offer help and when not to. And um, over time, as I've matured and, you know, done, done the work that I do, I, I actually don't sell and I don't try and coax people into my, my offerings because if there's no resonance, it's not going to work for them. So I want people who truly feel in their heart intuitively that what I have to offer is going to help them move towards whatever it is they need to move towards. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, it's a nice little segue, I think, an opportunity for a segue. Uh, we'd love you to delve into a little bit of what you do now, your work, and maybe like speak to uh, something you mentioned before in your origin story in terms of the comparison between your work now and then what it was like, you know, pre, um, awakening i suppose and and how that sort of contrasts mm. <laughs> pre-awakening i like it i'm still <laughs> i'm still waking up so yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have definitely do not have all of the answers and i'm definitely a seeker and an explorer and adventurer of life and yeah but pre pre my my point of impact as let's call it that or turning point my work was working for the man because society had said leave school get a job buy a house get married have kids yep. and i Script. thought that yeah i thought yeah. that was the path right yeah. so fast forward 20 years i'm not married i don't have kids i do have a relationship and i have no intention of getting married again um and my partner's totally okay with that he's fine um so you know, all these rules that were set down for me, I don't buy into them anymore. But I also found that I was working in a job where I actually was good at what I did. I enjoyed what I did. And I, um, but I also didn't know any different. So I was working in banking and finance and I worked for 22 years in that environment. But there was a, a deeper calling or a deeper urge for something else. And I didn't know what it was for many, many, many years and started to discover that just naturally people were drawn to me for either advice or a, an ear or whatever it might be. So people came to me with their problems. And I find that a lot of people who move into the sort of the, the coaching realm, that's where it sort of starts. So over time I went through the corporate, the corporate realm until it came to a point where there, it really felt like, and I use these words, that my soul was being sucked out of me. Like I really, it, there was no real enjoyment in what I was doing at a deeper level. You know, the people I worked with were great. The organisation was amazing. I was getting paid good money. You know, I was a senior manager doing amazing work, working with great people, yet there was something missing. So I decided to jump ship without a plan, without a client, without anything. Um, but I did have some savings behind me. So it's always a good thing for anyone wanting to leave their a job, make sure you've got some financial support behind you. And um, so I, I jumped into what I thought would be my calling, which is coaching. 
and I just wanted to coach people. Now, over the years, I've realized that it's not actually coaching that I do, but that's that's the mold that the world sort of knows it as. So what I do now is a mixture of things. I work with individuals and it's a mixture of coaching, so drawing out the best in them, teaching, bringing maps, models, frameworks, insights from all over the place, from sciences, ancient wisdom, you name it, whatever fits for that person, and also mentoring, so sharing portions of my story where it may fit in. So it's not just one thing, it's a bit of everything. So that's where I work with individuals. And generally you'll find that the individuals I work with are the Georges of 10 years ago. Mm. Yeah. So, so me as a, who was I 10 years ago? I was somebody working in a corporate environment, learning to, finding my way leading people, finding my way navigating through the corporate organisation. So generally I would be working with leaders within organisations um, to coach them. But also I work with Georges of 20 years ago. So those people who are just starting to understand there's more to who they are and breaking through some of those, some of those molds that they've been struggling within or the, the cages they've been in. So those sort of people I really get a lot of pleasure in, in working with to help them, just shake them up a little bit and make them question some of the things that are going on. And then on the other side, I also work um, in corporations and organisations, teaching and educating in the realm of and you sort of said this in the um, in the intro, Leslie, teaching in the realm of flow, mindset, peak performance, sort of the gamut of what I call being human. So everything that makes us up as being human, how can we become better at being a human? So there's so many aspects to that. And so I tailor workshops and programs for organisations to help them really support their employees through life and through work so they can show up at work um, and be more engaged and actually love life. Um, I'd actually read somewhere that you believe that self-mastery was the cornerstone to peak performance. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and um, I, I would totally wholeheartedly agree because, and it makes sense, right, because it's like if you're a better human, you can be better in, in your work, whatever you choose that to be. Yeah, absolutely. So, Sean, what would what would you define? I'm flipping. I'm going yeah. into host here. What would you cool. define self mastery as? Um, self mastery for me, I guess, would start with uh, knowing yourself and really asking yourself the questions to come to know yourself mm. um, and how you are versus how you perceive yourself to be. Um, I think we all have this um, this notion of who we want to be. And, and we try to act in that way. But then I feel there's also parts of us that are just the way that we are. Um, and, and we're that way for a number of reasons, how we've been, you know, nurtured since we were, we were little children, um, experiences that we've had that have, you know, our own moments of impact that, um, you know, uh, dictate how we move through, move through life and how we respond to situations and how we act um, a lot of the times on a subconscious level. Um, I feel like we think we're in control of a lot more than we actually are. Um, and I, I think understanding that and that that's a part of part of us and, and to what extent is, is a big part of self-mastery. Yeah. Yeah. And I've self-mastery has really fascinated me from a lot of, and it's actually grown to mean more things the more I sort of uncover about humans and, and how powerful we actually are when we know it. Um, but one of the things that I find a lot with the people that I work with, whether it be in my public workshops or coaching or corporate workshops, is a lot of people aren't disciplined and mastery is comes from that as well. So absolutely, it's everything you said, Sean, but add on top of that, discipline in the form of being able to give yourself a command and then follow through on it. And a lot of people don't get that at its core, what that means, because you can give yourself a command consciously from the conscious part of your mind, which controls 5% of, you do, of what you do. So you give yourself a command from one area, but 95% of what you do comes from the subconscious. So giving yourself a command and being able to actually follow through on that is a lot harder than people think. So self-mastery is knowing that, hey, I've got this idea, I've got this new practice I want to take on board, I've got this new behaviour or this new person I want to become. That's an idea. 
that's giving yourself a command. Now you've got to get rally the troops of your subconscious mind and you've got to lead yourself. You've got to lead every part of you below the conscious mind to pull that into action. That's self-mastery and knowing how to do that is where the game changes. I um I I wholeheartedly agree with that, and I and I echo the sentiments. And the way I always look at it, and this is just, and and our listeners will know this, is it's just um based on I guess the main modalities that I personally study and and resonate deeply with, and it's and it's all around uh, Zen Buddhism. Um, I experienced the difference between what I thought was you know self mastery, and this is you know based on it on a personal journey that I took myself on for five or six years up, up until I went and stayed in a Zen Buddhist monastery for uh, 15 days or so to, to learn from a um, Zen monk. And like you said, those, those uh, key principles of Zen Buddhism, it's a very simple um, doctrine, but it is the most difficult thing to master. And it's just about discipline, dedication, and, you know, uh, wholehearted, whole soul, um, dedication and intention to whatever you're practicing and that's completely it and that gives you the difference between what we sometimes like to say i guess it's a it's a difference between a, and a re- reaction to a response you know and that is a level of control that mm. many people uh i guess they haven't experienced before and it's harder to understand just because we have such a i guess rich um rich and stimulus world that is just continually bombarding us and mm. eliciting these reactions from us. And it's hard to just give ourselves a sense of space and, and solitude and, and peace to be able to even discern between what is coming from outside and inside. So, so yeah. yeah. I love that you say that, Leslie. And one of the things that I love that you said is that the, the principle is it's a very simple principle. It's a very simple belief system or actually more of a principle than anything, but, but it's not easy. It really isn't easy. And to add on to what you're saying there, you know, we walk through life and we have all of these amazing programs running subconsciously. Some serve us and some don't. But what happens is they got there because over time, as part of an efficiency exchange, your brain has said, oh, you've heard this five times now. I better remember it and make it a belief. Oh, you've done this four or five, ten times now. Hmm, Let's make that a habit, good or bad. And what happens is the brain now is scanning your environment through your senses constantly. So what you're hearing, seeing, smelling, touching and tasting. And there's a program for every sensory input. So if I see someone cut me off in traffic, right, I've seen that. The stored program is to do something. Now, for me, generally it is to, oh, let them in. But for other people, it is to scream, to yell, to honk the horn. That's automatic. That's a, as you said, Leslie, a reaction. A response is the space between the event and what you do. You get to think about it and the more you think about it and make a different choice, each time you do that, you, you have the ability to rewrite that program. So eventually someone cuts you off in traffic, you're no longer honking the horn and yelling, you're sitting back and treating it like you're in a monastery and you're just letting them in. Yeah, totally. And I think, um, again, that, that, that pause or that space in between, that is like basically my philosophy on on life so you know my my you know quote unquote business is finding space and this is all it's about you know and in terms of like what mastery is and you know attempting our best attempts to reach that and like you said in terms of uh, awakening we're always trying to get there but we never truly grasp it and that's uh, that too is something that i feel is is a uh, an important point to 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 acknowledge you know it's not really a destination it's really just something that we continually follow um but with creating that space we just come to a a innate remembrance you know it's more of an innate remembrance of who we are 
And that to me is, is like true mastery of just innately understanding who we are um, at the core of things, you know, free from, you know, any uh, external influence or corruption. So I guess that comes back again to a nice way of asking you a question about something you said before, um, unlearning, you know, to me that, that uh, adult learning is almost the bulk of it is, is actually unlearning. So <laughs> talk more to us more about that. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you a really good example for unlearning. <coughs> so 12 months ago, I decided it'd be pretty fun to learn how to do a backflip on a trampoline as an adult. So growing up as a, as a young kid, we would holiday in on the Southern coast of New South Wales. And they had three Olympic trampolines at this holiday park. And I would spend my childhood on it, bouncing around doing back salts, not back flips. They're slightly different. And, um, and I just taught myself how to do it, but I could never do a backflip in the air, feet to feet on a trampoline. So I reached 40, how, much, how old was I last year? 47. And I decided that, hey, hang on, let's um, get that childhood dream underway and let's go and learn how to do a backflip. So I enrolled in a local gymnastics um, where they teach children. They do not teach adults. There's, I'm the oldest one there. And so I rock up there ready to learn how to do a backflip. I had to unlearn everything that I'd learned that was wrong from doing going backwards. So first of all, I had to reteach myself how to fall backwards. And then I had to take that information and put it into the air. And I had so much unlearning to do because I had spent 47 years of my life moving forward. Now I had to undo all that and start telling my body to go up in the air and backwards. Now, there's kids at this gymnasium that are under 10 doing the backflips I want to learn how to do. And they just get out there and do it. I had to unlearn the fear that I had taken on over years as an adult, knowing that, hey, if I land incorrectly, I can break my neck as a child. I don't understand that and get that. You know, I could, all these things could go wrong. And so I have to unlearn that. So as we, move through life as adults we take we're taking with us everything along the way that becomes so ingrained and the unlearning is the struggle that is we have to we have to let those neural pathways loose we have to prune them away so we can create new ones for the new learning so as a child we're just creating new networks as an adult we're pruning then creating takes a little bit of work yeah just a little bit <laughs> <laughs> just a little bit yeah so, so so did you end up uh landing your backflip so for something that i thought would take oh i'll be able to get this done in like six lessons um at january this year before we went into lockdown i had i had mastered it quite quickly but i hadn't done it exactly how i, I wanted to perfect it not just do a backflip i wanted to do the perfect backflip uh so I think it was February or January this year, I had my last lesson before we went into lockdown and I was doing them, but it wasn't just me on a trampoline backflip to backflip. I was doing it onto huge mats and things. So yes, but no. And I don't know when I'm going back and I don't know whether it's been too long between lessons now. <laughs> Might have to un unlearn a bit more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll wait and see. Um, part of me goes, maybe just be satisfied with where you got with and move on. And then, Part of me, the master inside me goes, keep going, <laughs> do it, do it. You said you'd do it. Prove that someone of your age with no gymnastics experience can get out there and do it. Just prove it. So it's a, it's a, it is a challenge. I want to, if, if it's all right, I want to talk about something that Leslie, you brought up around space because it's been something I've been really sort of looking into him probably more recently in the last six months or more is exploring more of what space is. You guys want to go down that rabbit hole? I'd love to. So one of the things that I've, I've been sort of working with and still, you know, trying to deeply understand is we have Newtonian physics that says there's a cause and an effect. And I got that. And that 
was a big part and foundation of the work I do, helping people create the causes for the effects that they wanted in their life. So that made perfect sense. But it wasn't until I discovered that there's the cause and then there's the effect, but there's space in between. And the space in between is the creation. So getting really clear now on this deeper meaning of space is if I have an idea or a vision for something, whether it be a goal, whether it be healing, whatever it might be, that is the effect I'm after. Now I go back and think, well, what's the cause of it? Who I am is going to be the cause. But the creation along the way is all those little bits in the space in between, the actions you take, the thoughts you think, the feelings that you have. That's where creation happens. That's the, that's our biggest gift and our superpower is what we do in between. And a lot of people I, I'm pretty certain don't understand that it's that space that is actually the moment of the moments of creation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think Sean and I talk about this a lot and I think we speak on it in, in different ways, you know, and in, and I think, um, in popular culture, there's, there's different, like, you know, idioms that can be used to, to describe this, you know, like trust the process and things like that and not getting too tied up with, um, the end result. Um, but there's, there's a lot of truth in those sorts of things as well in that, um, not only do, do those sorts of, um, you know, approaches, uh, set you up for a, a level of failure because the outcome is never going to be exactly how you you know, envision it in your mind, but it doesn't exactly matter because whatever you do within the moment, within every single present moment, it culminates moment on moment to deliver you what is in your heart. If it is sincere, if it is pure, you know, if it, if, if it is from a place of pure spaciousness, you know, and this is like, it's a little irk of mine that when I hear people talk about um, the law of attraction and things like that, you know, and they think about, oh, you know, law of attraction, I just want to think about, you know, a million bucks and my Ferrari and I'm going to get it. And it, it's because when, when that, like, you know, surface level mindset is used to, to think about law of attraction, it's about getting something externally. But... To me, it really is just about clearing your space inside, you know, purifying inside everything that you hold within your heart and your soul, you know. And when everything is in alignment, then you will get what you quote unquote want, but it's innately what you want. Mm. You know what I mean? So it works so you're, really you're getting more who you are, not what you want. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And that's um yeah, you're speaking my language right there. I don't even need to add on to it because it's it's really interesting how people have, you know, they, they get into, I'm going to say the secret um, and what they call manifesting. And there's so many people out there that are manifest manifestation coaches and all these sort of things, yet they haven't deliberately created themselves yet. Um, so... It, again, it's another one of those simple ideas but takes quite a lot of effort and is not as easy as people make it out to be because you've really got to do inner work to be truly in alignment. Your your glow, your vibe, who you are needs to be aligned with the thing that you want um, and your desire and yeah. people don't understand that yet. Yeah, and I think maybe that's sort of like this leaning towards... Um, this instant gratification type deal. Cause a lot of people are quite impatient, especially in modern society. Um, you know, we instantaneously have, you know, the, the knowledge of the world in, in the palm of our hands right now. So um, people sort of have that inbuilt expectation. And I sort of go back to this, this um, quote by uh, Dr. Martin Shaw in his latest book, um, Courting the Wild Twin, where he just says, be cautious of the short route you know, because a lot of the time, if not all the time, and I would personally agree that um, all the time, if you're going for a shortcut, then it's probably going to be something that's going to fall short of, of what's what's uh, real and pure for you. 
And that sort of brings us back to that mastery piece as well, doesn't it? Mm. It really takes effort and being able to master every aspect of you so that you move towards the things that you desire. And what I've found is the more you master yourself, the less you desire. Absolutely. Absolutely. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. It's, very it's a, it's a very interesting. <laughs> like if you look at the, the Georgia of say 10 years ago, um, you know, the things that would have been on, let's say I had a vision board or whatever it might be, would have been a lot of materialistic things and none of that. I, I don't, I don't desire any of that anymore. Nice. I love nice things and I appreciate beautiful art and I definitely enjoy supporting people that create and make and build things. Um, but I don't have a need for a lot of things anymore. Yeah. I need to eat. I need to sleep. Um, but yeah. And I still do like nice things. Don't get me wrong, but you know, the desire, the deep desire to, I think it goes away from not having to prove myself to anybody anymore because I've proven myself to myself. Yeah. And I think there's like a big distinction between, between the things that you want and that you need. Mm. Like it's totally okay to want things, but it is interesting that the more you do master yourself, the less you want. I've experienced that as well. And it's very interesting to me because the same, like I used to, you know, there was the list of the things that I wanted that were material run way, way down. And then um, I think more than anything now, I just want to live according to who I want to be more than anything else. And, and there's nothing material that does that. Mm. Um, and, and it's been interesting. And I think um, Les and I actually, the one of the recent episodes we recorded was about space and, and, and not space so much as presence. And I think that's something that's super important in that um, you mentioned the space between the cause and the effect. And I think that so many times we're just really focused on the cause or something that happened and, and how that's affected us. Or we're just thinking about the effect that we want and, and how we're going to get there but it's in the now and the present moment and, and what we actually choose to do and then being present and uh, having an intention and then being present as we start to move through the actions to try and get us to whatever effect we're getting to that actually has the power. Like you mm. said, that's, that's, the, that's the powerful part of it. And if we spend too much time focused on the cause or too much time focused on where we want to get to and not actually doing something about it, um, we tend to get bogged down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I love too around you know, that mention of, of space. And I'm going to link this into what Leslie said earlier, that we, we hold information in the palm of our hands. Well, for millennia, we've held information in the seat of our soul. And the presence and the space allows us to tap into that information. And a lot of people don't. They, you know, let me Google that. Let me ask somebody what I should do right now. Yet in the seat of your soul is a great deal of wisdom that you can tap into, but you need presence and space to do that. So, yep, you can grab your phone, grab your computer and get all the information you need, but what is right for you sits right within you. Absolutely. And like, it's, it's like, and, and every like recorded history, even before recorded history, we can, that is a testament to what you just said, you know, we can look back at, you know, philosophy and um, things that are recorded, you know, 2000, pre 2000 years ago, you know, in ancient Greece, the Stoics and um, <clears throat> Eastern philosophy with the Confucians and, and um, Taoism and things like that, that wisdom, it still runs true to, to, to this day. And that isn't about anything intellectual per se. It is just wisdom of the human being, you know, and, we each can experience that in our own ways if we give ourselves the space to do so, like you said. Um, and it's not, not to say that we need to simply read the text and intellectualize it. Again, that completely misses the point. It's that old analogy of uh, discerning this, the difference between uh, the finger pointing at the moon and the moon itself, you know? That, that, that thing in between is not necessarily it. Mm. But we need to give ourselves the space in order to, you know, be able to grasp that. Yeah, and I, I think it would be wonderful if, and I think it's a little bit of a blessing of COVID where things are starting to slow down a little bit and some people, not all, are blessed with a little bit of space. I'm, I'm call out to any mums out there that are, you know, homeschooling, running full-time jobs and holding 
a house down, a household down as well. I know you probably don't have space, but for some of us, there is more space for us to do some of that introspective work, whether we're doing it or not, who knows, but it's a beautiful opportunity to, to go within. Absolutely. Um, I couldn't agree more. Um, and yeah, I just want to go a bit more down this path of like what, what we're searching for is within because it's something that Les always used to say to me and he's been saying to me for a number of years. And I just, it was, it was one of those things that I hear and be like, yeah, like I get it, but I didn't truly believe it. Like, um, and, and I guess that's one thing that I love about, you know, the relationship Les and I share, which is um, we put things forward to each other um, and then we internalize and we don't always agree. And we let each other know, right? So that was one of those things that like he used to say, and I was like, yeah, I can see where you're coming from, but it just sounded like a nice, um, like it would be really nice if that was the case. That's, that's what I used to think. <laughs> and he's laughing there. He's muted himself, right? <laughs> that's what I thought. And, but recently I'm like, holy shit, he had the answer. He had the answer. And I just needed to actually listen. Mm-hmm. And it's only been recently that I've actually slowed down and taken time to and spent time with myself that I learned the lesson. And I just want to put that out there for people that are listening that like you really need to take the time and never try to tell people they should do anything. But I feel like that's one of those things that we <laughs> should do. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a really beautiful piece of advice or recommendation or encouragement, however you want to use it, that you're putting out there into the airwaves. However, what you'll find is when the opportunities for most of us, most humans, when the opportunity and space presents itself, we have a need to fill it with a conversation. I'll pick up the phone and call someone or maybe I'll scroll on Facebook. Hey, Netflix, I'll watch a whole series of Netflix or whatever it is. They'll want, they want to fill it with something other than going within because I, I, I don't know why, but my guess is that they they don't understand the power of doing that or they're afraid of what they might find. Yeah. And I think, look, uh, I myself, you know, I do that from time to time as well. And like a, a good example is instead of simply going for a walk and being conscious of yourself going on a walk, you'll, you'll put in your headphones and listen to something whilst you're walking, you know. And that's just one of those classic things we've been I can speak for myself in that I know that I've been conditioned a certain way to to simply um, crave this external stimulus. And it does create this distraction that distracts me from the harder questions that I need to ask myself. And I resonated with what you said about in your story, Georgia, when you were talking about um, that deep yearning in, in your corporate job, you know, in finance, you knew there was something more. That is, that like, you know, I could just flip the voices and that would be my story as well. I was, I, I was just, um, you know, not courageous enough to simply look inside and ask those questions. I was too scared. It took cancer to, you know, shake me up and say, you better ask those questions now. And, um, you know, here we are, you know, <clears throat> the other thing that I want to talk about and, you know, touch on the, that, what Sean mentioned is um, the word listen, you know, and that for, for most people, that would be just like, oh, what are you talking about? We're just listening to your voice now. You know, the words are coming into my ear. But listening, like through the, the sense of the ease versus, you know, your heart hearing whatever it is and resonating through your heart is a difference, right? That is true listening. That is like truly hearing something. And I always use the example of, you know, when you hear a song that you really love, and it, and it moves you in a certain way. You know, you've heard it, you know, at a deeper level, more than just through, you know, your, your instrument of hearing, your ears. You've heard it through your soul, through your heart. And it's like you read a line in a book and it just like, it just punches you in the gut. And it's like, yes, you know, that's it. It's not that you just read the words, but it's speaking to you on a deeper level, right? So that's true listening. But again, you need a really acute sense of awareness Mm. to be able to listen at that level, right? Absolutely. And your distinction there is just beautiful because I know when, you know, I I talk to certain people and I know they're not 
listening in the true sense. They're hearing but not listening, uh, which means, you know, not giving that attention and really feeling what I'm saying as opposed to just hearing what I'm saying. And the people, I'm not going to mention names that, you know, because you never know, they might listen to the podcast. And then they say, but I heard what you said. And then they'll repeat verbatim what I just said. I go, yeah, but you weren't listening. You weren't actually looking at me. You weren't paying attention. You were distracted. And it's a real gift in nowadays, in modern times, to be able to truly listen. But going back to what you're saying about, you know, going for your walks with your headphones on and so forth, there's more for us to listen to than just other people speaking. So like you, Leslie, around about 18 months ago, I was a walker with my headphones because this was the way that I could really get the information I needed and I could hack, I could stack, I could walk and listen and learn and get all these things done. And then I went, hang on, my biggest learning is going to come with no headphones and just being present on my walk. So I no longer walk with headphones. I haven't walked with headphones now for over 12 months. I walk with my dogs through nature and pay attention to nature. And I look and listen and and ready for the the messages that nature might be giving. But also I'm clearing space for anything, any problems or questions I've been sort of sort of tossing with or whatever it might be, the answers will come to me in those spaces because I'm allowing. So it's a beautiful thing to create space, move away from those things that we think we've got to do because I could listen to a podcast and get information or I could go out there and actually tune into a deeper part of who I am and a deeper part of who we all are and just tap into that information. I I think we can take in all the information we want, but until we give ourselves the space and allow ourselves to actually delve down and feel things, the information is pretty useless. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and there's a big difference between knowing something and doing something with that knowledge. So you need to process, you need to enact, you need to contemplate. Contemplation is one of the biggest steps in learning. And a lot of us miss that. We'll read a book and we don't stop and, and look at that one sentence and go, what did that sentence actually mean? And reread it 10 times. Yeah. No, we'll just read a book, go finish, put it on the shelf. I know that. I'm going to have a great dinner conversation with my friends because I know stuff, right? But do you really, do? can you expand on it? What does it mean for you? What did it draw up for you? Um, what connections have you made with past knowledge? You know, a lot of people don't allow that to happen. And it's a bit of a disservice to ourselves if we really want to tap into self-mastery and obtain wisdom. Yeah. And I guess this is like this this like funny paradox with with the culture these days with people like um, Jim Quick, you know, with his speed reading, and um, there's a lot of people who sort of advocate um, how many book CEOs read um, per per year and all that sort of stuff. And it speaks exactly to what you're saying, you know, um, you know, it's sort of cool to say that I've been able to read, you know, fifty plus books in uh, in the year. But what actually have you been able to, you know, derive from that, you know, um, other than to say um, you've read that many books and have a cool post on your Instagram or whatever it is, you know. Um, again, it's like one of those things that's it's very, it's one of those um, tough internal battles that, that people may, you know, tussle with at times, you know, so. Yeah. Look, I could, I could, we could talk to somebody because we all have knowledge around potentially the law of attraction, right? We could sit here and talk about interesting conversation, but what's going to make it richer is if I share a story or two or 10 or 20 of where I've put it into practice, where I've actually taken that, contemplated it, experimented with it, and now I've got the results. That is learned, experienced wisdom. Knowledge and wisdom are completely different. Knowledge is just reading books. Wisdom is putting what you've learned into practice and getting some form of result that you can share with the world. Absolutely. Such an important distinction there. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. 
So, you know, thinking about you earlier about how you said, you know, you were working in corporate and you had the soul sucked out of you and you didn't leave, blah, 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 it took a cancer. I shouldn't say blah, 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 and then say that it took a cancer to do <laughs> it. I'm just dismissing it, right? Um, so here's how I looked at it. I can remember I was walking down, so I was working in, for those at uh, Melbourne, I was walking to the head office of the organisation I worked uh, worked for and I was walking, this was my turning point for leaving. I was walking down towards head office, down Collins Street, and I saw all of these swarms of people just walking to all of these head offices, like all these little worker ants going to the, you know, going to the, what are they called where ants live? It's not a hive, it's a whatever. Ant hill, is it an ant hill? Yeah, they're, they're, going, well, they're all <laughs> going to the ant hill, right? So they're all walking down toward this ant hill and all of a sudden this voice in my head said, if you're walking with the crowd, you're walking in the wrong direction. Mm. No idea where I'd heard it or where it came from, but it just sat in there. And I just, I took a moment, it was probably only a couple of seconds, and I stopped when I was walking and I looked around and I went, I've got to leave. Now, from that moment on, I didn't leave the next day. I didn't leave the next month. I put what I knew and what I'd been working with and what I've experimented with for, at that time, the previous I'm going to say 18 years, 17 years, what I'd been doing in my life, I thought, hey, let's create an opportunity here. So I thought to myself, I'm going to leave, but I'm going to get paid to leave. I'm going to get the organisation to pay me to leave. Now, at that time, I was in a really good job. There was no, there was no way they were going to pay me to leave. So what I did, I got really clear on who I wanted to be and what I wanted to be able to leave that organisation with a payout. 18 months later, I was sitting in my car after I'd had my last day at ANZ with a healthy paycheck in my bank account, looking back at the building going, hmm, you did it. It wasn't just me deciding that along the way I had to take risks, along the way I had to take actions, but I had to when an opportunity came in front of me, I took it. And so I, first of all, got really clear on what I wanted and I started from that moment being a business owner, not an employee. I stepped into that energy. Yeah. But I also stepped into the energy of having a lump sum behind me even though I didn't at that time. Mm. So my payout, or let's call it, it was a redundancy, was already in the making 18 months before it happened. And here's a really funny thing. I don't know whether the universe tests us or what. I don't think it does. But when I found out that I had um, my role was no longer available, um, somebody that I'd been working with pulled me aside and said, look, we'd love to keep you on. We can offer you part-time on the salary on at the moment. So therefore you can start your business that you want to start, but you can also work for us. Sounds like a golden handshake right there, right? Mm. I said no, because I knew that I had wanted to really cut my ties and the type of person that I was would still devote 100% of my energy to the organisation out of loyalty and whatever it might have been that was running in the background. So I, I actually said no to that and ended up leaving so that I could test my theory and see if I could make a successful business. And we're coming up for seven and a half or maybe eight, I don't even know how long it is now, eight years. So I, I made it past the five-year BS that everyone says. <laughs> um, so there you go, creation putting what I had learned into practice and then moving forward and putting everything along the way into motion and being the person that I needed to be to make that desire a reality. And isn't it funny, those, those tests that you mentioned that the universe throws in front of us, it's almost like a, um, like a test of our, our integrity towards our, our truth, you know? Um, and, 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 it's a, and it's an interesting, I guess, um, tussle or balancing act between, you know, this, this need for what we call or what we know as um, just 
these resources to survive versus just simply delving into the unknown, mm. you know, and really, and, and that's, that's what it is, right? Starting your own business is, is there's so much unknowns to it. And um, if, if you look at the alternative, there's so much comfort uh, involved. What we think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, um, so it's such an interesting thing. And um, I guess the, the, the moral there for me, and it comes back to the, the hero's journey, right? That um, the cave we fear to enter holds the treasure that we seek. You know, that's a famous Joseph Campbell quote that we, we often use in the podcast. And, and it's so true, you know. It, it simply is just about, you know, turning and facing those things that, that somewhat scare us. And, mm. you know, we, might, we may be put in very uh, uncomfortable situations. And I'm sure you've had those throughout the years. Um, but that's all part of the journey, right? Absolutely. Mm. One of the one of the things on that, and I, by the way, that quote has been a driving force behind what I do because understanding that the things that we want out of life, we have to step up for it. We have to enter and become somebody else. Enter mm. the cave of the unknown. The things, the things that we want are never in our comfort zone. They're never what we know. They're always we've got to become someone different. We've got to step into different surroundings, whatever it might be for it to be fulfilled. And we, we forget that. But definitely along the way, there have been so many, so many caves that <laughs> I really didn't want to enter, but I did. And it's, um, I think it's a testament to putting into practice some of the principles and theories that I believed in and also the things that I espouse to the people that I train and educate and coach is that we don't realise how awesomely resourceful we are as human beings. We just don't realise this untapped potential that is within us. And when we work for an organisation, we don't need to tap into it because we're told what to do. We have this belief of safety where your biggest safety comes from faith in yourself faith in your ability to overcome whatever life throws at you, knowing that you have an amazing mind, brain and body that can get you out of anything regardless. Like I'm going to just use a current example, people complaining in Melbourne about having to wear masks. Seriously, people, (laughs) like seriously, um, you're only going to feel like you're forced to do something if you feel like you're forced to do something. You know, think of Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. It's the meaning you give something that creates whether you feel like you're a captive or whether you're free. Yeah, so. absolutely. I think we, we actually referred to that um, uh, Viktor Frankl last, last episode that we recorded, so, you know, um, completely resonate with that. But... Um, you know, I'll, I'll not throw to you, Sean. I mean, you you yourself, you've gone through quite a journey. I've known you for, you know, more than a decade now. And I've seen you in your corporate work, uh, corporate working life and then coming out and, you know, frankly, you've, you've, done, you've done it hard in, in business. You know, you've done it the hard way and um, you've, you've developed um, a lot since then, since, you know, you've stepped out and done it your own and you're thriving now. Um, but I want you to talk to that a bit more and, you know, more specifically about facing those, um, I guess, those fears, those shadows, man, I mean, along the way, because I know you have, have had plenty. Yeah, well, I guess um, one thing that I definitely want to echo, Georgia, is that, you know, we have this massive reservoir of resourcefulness within us. And until you really put in a position to become resourceful, or to have to be resourceful, you don't know how deep that reservoir really is. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing that you mentioned as well is to to have a good financial buffer if you're going to leave corporate to go into your own thing. I did that as well. So, like, I'd saved, um, you know, I was saving for a property at the time. But um, I had this uneasiness as well. I was doing the trying to run my business on the side while working a full-time job that was, far more intensive than full-time already. 
Um, and got to this point where I was like, I wanted to buy a property at the time. And I was speaking to, to a good friend of mine um, who also, you know, serves as a mentor for me. And he was like, Coops, what if you want to buy a property or you can, you know, do your business full time with that money? He's like, what do you think has the potential to perform better and to return better for you? And I have to ask myself that question. Right. And I was like, oh, well, properties, you know, in Sydney, they double every 10 years, as they tell you. Then I was like, but my business, it's really down to what I, what I put into it and, and what I choose to do. And what ended up happening was I wanted to back myself. I wanted to be that person who could get out of anything, who could achieve anything that they wanted. And that's the, that is why I chose to do my own business um, full time and to go into that and, and head into that cave. And it's been a pretty deep, dark cave <laughs> to be honest. Um, but, um, you know, the reason that I continue to persist in business period and, and to work for myself is I want to be someone who can roll off my own steam and also keep on, um, keep on increasing what my potential is. And that, that's the beauty of business to me more so than the money. Um, not going to lie and say that the money wasn't something that was, you know, what pushed me towards it as well in the beginning. It definitely did. But it's, it's morphed into this, um, you know, self-testing environment where I keep on pushing myself in, into those uncomfortable situations and, you know, to become that person who can always figure it out. And, and that's something that's important to me. That, that's who I want to be in life. And, um, you know, by stopping, I was really chasing the money for the first few years because I was like, oh, you know what, like I've saved this money, but I'm spending it now and it's going to run out. And it did. To be honest, it did. It ran out, right? So, and then I had to make more and I was like, oh, it's the money, it's money. But I'm like, yeah, but if you really develop this skill, right, and you become this person who you want to be, that's where it's at. And the money will come. And when I took the time to actually do that, and also you avoid the caves a lot of times, because it's nice and bright outside. And, and you think, you know, uh, I'll just do that. It'll be fine. I'll just do that. It'll be fine. And, and you keep like pushing along and, and things get a bit better than they, you get knocked back down a bit. But you never have that moment until you get into the cave. And a lot of the times you, you go down and you're like, oh, is this what it is? Because you don't know what's in there. And the only way you can know is if you go down. And then you got to really draw on that resourcefulness and, and yeah, that, that's been my journey. So, yeah, I don't really know where I was going with that one, but. <clears throat> no, I mean, you touched on the right things, bro. Yeah. And, and I think, look, at the end of the day, the, the thing where, where I guess the, the key that I'm drawing from these, you know, these conversations, right, is that, you know, um, this, this incredible, you know, intellectual thinking mind that we all are blessed with, it can be the greatest blessing, but it can also be this curse that hinders, you know, the realization of life. And like, what I mean by that is like, we've talked about these things about, you know, being coddled as a society and a civilization to the point where we aren't, you know, being tested at all. You know, everything, we have technology to do everything for us. And we are so used to that, that we are scared of any sort of, you know, darkness, let alone you know, the deepest, darkest caves of your soul that you must traverse, you know, in order to evolve and find who you are inside, you know. So maybe that's a good place, a good point to, to leave the conversation today. We've, we've talked about some beautiful things and thank you so much for joining us today, uh, Georgia. It's been a pleasure and I'm sure we could have, you know, if there was no time, we'd, we could have gone for hours and hours and hours, but um, I'll give you the floor. If there's anything you want to plug, uh, where can people find you? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Can I just say one thing? I just want to, of course. I, wanna, I just want to sort of um, add an exclamation mark to something Sean said and maybe to get listeners to think a little bit about this. So, you, Sean, went to your mentor when you were making the decision around buying a property or starting your business. And the mentor asked, which one's going to give you the biggest return? The thing is that we've been conditioned as a society to look at and to 
grade the return based on monetary value. But which one's going to give you the greatest return for your life? I think that's a better question to ask. Which one's going to make you grow more? Which one's going to make you be a better person? Which one's going to help you to give back to society? I think they're far greater questions or not greater questions, but a really nice lens to look at that question through. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Thanks for that. And so where can people, what have I got going on? So if anyone wants to jump on board and start to pull back some of those layers, I do have a couple of public programs that are now run online. They used to be um, workshops and masterclasses. So one is called Life Reloaded. And um, we've got a cohort going through that at the moment. But I think there's another one starting in August. And they can jump onto my website, bluechipminds.com. And you can suss that one out. Um, so, yeah, we have a look at all the different things that make you become a better human. So you can really, you know, nail it, go within and do whatever you need to do to make your life what you would like it to be. And, um, yeah, I also, as you mentioned earlier, have a podcast, Jump On Board. Like your podcast, guys, we get some amazing guests on there that are doing some kick-ass things in the world. So jump on board there. And then just on social media, reach out social media, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, and Facebook, I have a group called Conscious Architects of Life, if you want to jump on there too. Absolutely. Thank you. And we'll add all that into the show notes for you so everyone can uh, find you easily. Um, how about you, Shauna? Where can people find you, mate? Yep. Um, for that, I love the name of your podcast, Georgia, <laughs> Ellis in Wonderland. It's very cool. Also, when I searched it, it came up immediately. So that's very cool. <laughs> There's no others when you first have anything else. Um, easiest place to find me is on Instagram, just Sean underscore Coop. That's S-H-A-U-N underscore C-O-O-P. And you can just um, hit me up there. And how about you, Les? Yeah, you can find me on my website, findingspace.co. Uh, Facebook and Instagram, it's the same handle. It's at findingspace.co. Um, I also recently signed up on uh, Twitter. I don't know how that's going to go, but, uh, you know, give us a follow, give us a like, uh, finding space co no dot there. Um, you can also get in touch with Sean and I, uh, anything about this particular podcast episode or previous episodes, any questions, feedback, suggestions, uh, or if you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, uh, just send us an email, the hustle and flow podcast at gmail.com. Cool guys. And as always, um, just for listening today, a humble request. If you took a little nugget from here, something that, you know, sparked some thought for you, we ask that you just share it with one other person, um, you know, a family member, a colleague. There's certainly a lot that I'm going to be thinking about after this one. Some more questions I'm going to be asking myself and um, taking some time and space to, to contemplate. Um, you know, that's why we have these conversations and put them out there is so that, you know, to provoke thought and hopefully have you question some of your beliefs and see if they, they serve you because we really do believe that when we think better and feel better, we can do better. So until next time, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Georgia. Thank you.